With this talk, uh, I'm not going to go very deep in the details of GPOP, so I'll try to give you just uh, uh, a very brief overview about different capabilities that the, that the code has. So, basically, you, uh, all of you have heard that okay, GPO works with the DAW, I think, from the current thing, I thought his case here can do a little bit more about that. And uh, code can do quite many different things. I'll talk a little bit more detail about uh, different choices of basic sets in GPO. I think that's uh, one of the unique features of code. There are not that many codes around that can use multiple basic sets. And I will, uh, I will shortly present some of the different uh, working modes of each of the code. And then I spend a little bit more time again on the parallelization issues of the performance of the code. Parallelization is uh, once again something where I think people I'm going to say shines very carefully quite well. And if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please just, uh, just ask. Uh, the sort of thing that uh, people started with, and uh, maybe still the main working model, or main basis set, is the use of uh, real space grids. And with real space grids, I just naturally that we uh, you represent your physical quantities. Wave functions, densities, potentials, the main quantities in constant density functional theory, pipe values at the uh, grid points. And this grid in GPO that's all that's uniform. Basically, there is uh, one single parameter which now controls that pressure to calculation, and that's the grid spacing age. In principle, this grid spacing can be different in different dimensions, so you could think of uh, having uh, three different parameters, but from practical purposes, typically you always want to use practically the same grid space. And so the nice thing here is that the accuracy you can increase in a systematic fashion just by decreasing this grid space. Calculus, of course, becomes uh, uh, more expensive, but uh, you, get, you get more accuracy. Um, when solving the equations in, in DFT, <coughs> there are multitudes of different uh, data derivatives involved, kinetic energy in the Kosha Hamiltonian, uh, Laplace in the Kosha equation, and when using this uh, uh, finite uh, T series space mode, you uh, solve these derivatives, so evaluate these derivatives using numerically using finite differences. In principle, also the sort of Order of difference tensile is a parameter that, uh, that affects the accuracy of calculation, but in most cases you can pretty well do with the default, default order of the finite difference tensile and just play with the, with the grid spacing to get the accuracy of the calculation. Uh, one advantage of this kind of real space approach is that it allows uh, quite flexible treatment of boundary conditions. And when we solve the equations and do the calculations, the boundary conditions they actually uh, come, come to play when you evaluate the, the derivatives. So if you think derivative, it, it depends on the change in the neighborhood, neighborhood of point. So when you evaluate the derivatives, you typically take into account these boundary conditions. And GPO in real space mode, you can use uh, sort of two different kind of boundary conditions when evaluating these derivatives. And they are basically that uh, annual wave functions, densities, and also in where you can say potential is zero at the boundary of simulations. And that's of course well applicable to the finite systems for molecules, atoms, clusters, and especially for wave functions and densities, it doesn't make any very severe approximation to put them zero at the at the box edge because they typically decay exponentially, finite systems they decay exponentially when you go far away from the actual physical part of the system. Uh, for potential, especially if you want to treat charge systems, potential decays quite so the Coulomb potential decays quite slowly, and you have to do some special tricks there to actually, actually treat the system. But when, 
when using this kind of uh, finite boundary conditions, you can make analytic corrections with the stuff, but the charge systems and reciprocal systems with the dipoles and quadrivoles can be treated separately. And one more advantage is that if you're doing charge systems with the periodic boundary conditions, with supercells, you have to be more careful about the interaction between the images which you do not have with the, the general boundary conditions. For bulk systems, periodic boundary conditions is, uh, is the natural choice. And here the log theory comes into play, so you will have K okay points in the brilliant zone. And people can treat them just, just fine. You can of course mix also these two boundary conditions. So if you're studying, for example, wires, natural boundary conditions are periodic in the dimension of the wire and finite in the other two dimensions. And there is like the surfaces to have a finite boundary condition in one dimension and periodic boundary condition. That. <coughs> that's uh, that's very easy to do with the with the real space. Uh, sort of uh, second working mode in GPO, also in sort of, I guess, uh, chronological order, when these different cases sets there, when including the code, is the linear combination of atomic orbitals. And I think uh, Ask is going to give you more detailed description about that later on today. Basically, the idea is that uh, now, instead of representing our uh, wave functions just on grid points, we use some basis functions and use basis set expansion for representing optical <coughs> quantities. And the basis functions are now something which are more or less localized within certain spheres that are atoms. And they are typically generated from some atomic calculus. And you can have a different, uh, different number of basis functions and different uh, type of basis functions in the calculus. And what you can actually do with GPO, you can sort of seamlessly switch between these uh, ACAO basis and the real space grid. And that's actually something which is always done when you do normal real space calculations. And the initial case for the wave function is always obtained by making a sort of uh, solution with a with very limited ACAO basis. Uh, nice thing about this basis is typically it's it's quite compact basis and enables fast calculations. Um, boundary conditions when using this basis set are practically the same as with the, with the real space model. The uh, latest uh, addition to the basis functions in GPO are the traditional plane waves. Um, if you have a periodic bulk system, and especially if you think that uh, Free electrons can be described easily with plane waves. Plane waves is sort of natural basis set. Uh, all, all functions with satellite with respect to the crystal lattice can be uh, represented as, as some plane waves. Um, and similar to the real space grid mode, there is basically just a single parameter controlling the accuracy, which is just the number of plane waves typically specified by the energy cutoff. Uh, because plane waves, they are always I mean, involved with the, the reciprocal lattice vectors there, uh, your simulation cell is always uh, periodic, at least in, in implicit sense. And that might give us some further considerations if you want to do uh, finite systems, you have to do supercells and sometimes maybe take care about or worry about a little bit about interaction between periodic images. Or of your surfaces or your molecules or clusters. I, I think there is no sort of uh, ultimate basis set developed yet. Some people might argue that finite element is, the, is this one, but uh, I'm not sure if it's that, that's in practice. There are some pros and cons of different, different basis sets. Um, both with free space grids and lane days, you typically get the systematic convergence with a single parameter. Um, uh, on the other hand, with real space grid, for example, they were especially when you're doing uh, exact heat chains and hybrid functions, there are some integrals which are not so easy to evaluate 
in real space as in, in reciprocal space, where lay base might be more convenient. Uh, Localized space is that it's very compact and allows fast calculations, uh, but uh, typically you cannot, at least in the asystematic fashion, just improve the accuracy by including more and more functions. So systematic convergence might be, might be more difficult. Uh, the space script that has uh, very good parallelization prospects, as I'll discuss uh, more later on this talk. While with plain base, you know, typically you have to use fast Fourier transforms, and they are something that's uh, more difficult to, to parallelize. Uh, plain base, they are typically very fast for small to medium sized systems, uh, with various and detective libraries. But sort of uh, which one to use is it, it really depends on what problem you are solving, uh, what kind of system you are studying, and what kind of factors you need. In some systems, you can get actually very accurate result just with the compact LCO basis, while for other systems, for single property, you might need uh, more accurate uh, resources or data basis. Do you have any questions about the uh, basis setting GPO at this point? Yes? So, if you have a uh, heavier supersized system, so then it's uh, better to use uh, main base and then it's better to use uh, real space kits. So, can you say some numbers how many atoms you could have in the supersized I would say that for if you need to include some empty space. Uh, so you're studying finite system, my choice I think would I don't know, I didn't actually test it for single molecules and atoms which one works better. But I would typically go for probably the real space mode. So you don't have to sort of worry about the images. If you are calculating a defect in the periodic solid, so there is no empty space. Yeah, then the result was no empty space. I mean that's uh, that's a good question. I would say that if you think about the efficiency, maybe someone has more accurate numbers, but I would say that if you have a <coughs> less than 20 atoms or so, plain data is probably faster, but uh, when you go to larger systems, the uh, space mode is probably faster. Sort of. If you, I mean, if you need 500 atoms, uh, I would definitely do the real space code. And also with this 500 atom system, you probably can use, if you have a big computer, you can use more CPUs. And also that will make the calculus faster. At least it's cheap. We, we haven't parallelized the this year, so that's more than the parallelization capabilities. Okay. Let's have then a very sort of uh, quick walk through to the different features. So, like uh, I guess any DFT package, Chipo can calculate total energies, forces, magnetic moments, and then you can use this information for optimizing structures, calculating lattice constants, calculating formation energies, and so on. And then you can you can evaluate the band structures, tensile states, and analyze your system on base of its ethnic structure. Chico has quite a lot of different the exchange correlation functionals and I think we'll <coughs> hear some more detailed presentations on them. We use quite a lot the LibXC library which provides several different LDAs, GGAs, different meta GGAs, hybrid functionals, one functionals for Chico. Uh, so not every possible exchange correlation functional is implemented but uh, there are quite uh, quite good suggestions of them. Uh, in addition to ground state, Chibo can also do excited states. So time dependent density function theory has been implemented in uh, a few different uh, versions. We can solve time dependent dependent constant equations directly in the time, time domain by the real time propagation. And use that for calculation of uh, optical spectra, and maybe more importantly, with this formula, we can also study nonlinear phenomena such as uh, uh, high-energy generation nonlinear emission spectra, 
and some non-adaptive dynamics, which we also hear a little bit more. GPO can also to do family uh, dependent density factor theory with the linear response formalism, and for finite systems, one can use the Casita formalism and sort of construct a big matrix in electron hole basis, diagnostic matrix, and of the, the excitation energies of the system within the within time period. Uh, one can also use that, uh, that formalism for the optical spectra. For extended systems, one can sort of solve the Dyson equation for the susceptibility and obtain also optical spectra and, for example, uh, electron energy loss spectra with that formalism. Uh, if one wants to do, let's say, sometimes uh, Make it fancy or just a different way of studying static state properties. Many body perturbations theory can be done with cheap nowadays. There is GW approximation has been implemented there, so one can calculate, the, as you know, the Gonsa mighty values. Uh, they are just mathematical constructs no, with no real connection to the, to the physical system, but with GW, you will get the correct or the true quasi particle energies, quasi particle. Uh, Band structure and also the band so, uh, For optical properties with the uh, increased time dependent DFT, it's the exact same as I mean, crossover. But of course, everything depends on the exchange coils functional or exchange coils internal you are using. And the ones typically used with the uh, DDFT cannot account for the external effects. And if these kind of effects are important for the Optical properties we're interested in. Chico can also solve the beta salvetic equation. Uh, you can see actually, actually picture there that uh, how, uh, how the optical spectra silicon is, is changed when you use it uh, here. TDDFT here, so they could buy this A like LDA versus or beta salvetic there are lots of other features also. You can do transport with finite bias using non equilibrium green functions and with the uh, in silo basis, uh, x ray apparatus, mm -hmm. the stress, the which is delta S. There are really lots of stuff, and I'm sure within these two days you hear many examples of this. Not all these features necessarily work with all the basis functions. So, for example, transport you cannot really do with the Real space may function as real space grids. Of course, some quantities are evaluated from real space, but we use LC over there. And TDDFT uh, in real time domain, for example, you cannot do with plane base. So there are some limitations in this matrix that we can do. Um, from a user point of view, I think there are some very nice features in the code. And that's just how you construct your input files and input scripts. So GPO uses atomic simulation environment, which provides extremely uh, powerful Python scripting environment for setting up uh, the atomic positions, unit cells, and so on. You can do simple things in a very simple fashion by using this interface, but you can also do <coughs> extremely advanced and complex things with the uh, a little modest problem keyboard by using this one. Um, if you're a developer, code is designed to be quite modular, uh, uses some object oriented features and so on. So, when implementing new features, is I don't know if it's painless, but uh, not, uh, not so painful as maybe with some, some other codes. You can, you can run the code in a very wide variety of, of computer systems, ranging from uh, Basic workstations and Linux clusters to biggest supercomputers in the world. I think Chico has been run with the 250,000 CPU cores. <coughs> more or less proof of concept, not only real calculation, but it's, it's doable. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about the valid expedition support for graphic processing. Yeah. As I have mentioned a couple of times, parallelization is something that I think people is very good at. So I will 
will discuss a little bit more uh, what kind of uh, parallelization possibilities we have in the code. Uh, resolution is not the optimal I think here, but I hope you can more or less see the basic constant equations here. And if you think that sort of which kind of decrease of freedom we have in the equations uh, for a Hamiltonian, we have a if you have a Hulk system, okay, the code records, we have K points. If you have a Mantic system, we will have a spin there. And then we naturally have the index for the state, I here. And especially if we are working with the real space mode, the three points that the one is that represented is one sort of here, equal freedom. And now what people can actually do, we can in real space calculation, it can parallelize over all these decrease of speed. For and actually also for, for the CEO, where you about something in real space calculation. Parallelism on K points and spins, that's uh, quite trivial. You don't really need any communication, communication between there. But of course, the amount of K points and spin you will have on the monkey systems. They are somehow more limited. You cannot use. <coughs> Drastic, uh, drastic amount of CPU cost for them. Uh, for the domain decomposition, the real space grid. Uh, nice thing is that uh, uh, if you divide the uh, your grid to different processors like this one, you need within this domain you need information only from neighboring domains when developing the derivatives. Which means that uh, even if you have in your 1000 CPU cores for this domain decomposition, only the neighboring CPUs have to communicate talk with each other with this information, uh, which makes the parallelization uh, very easy. The parallelization of the electronic states in basic uh, cross state DFT, that's a little bit more tricky. Uh, I don't know if you're already aware, but when you do a very big calculation with sort of conventional DFT packages, G4, you will start to spend 80% of your time just by auto-normalizing the wave functions. And this auto-normalization is something where you have to communicate large amounts of data. And the parallelization is a little bit more tricky. Uh, <coughs> if you're using some of the, let's say, more specific features, uh, there might be additional parallelization cross threads. There are sort of very trivial ones. You can calculate, uh, for example, images of the atomic system built in different atomic agents very easily in parallel. I don't think that's real parallelization, but that's something you can do. If you're doing, uh, for example, real time, time-dependent DFT, then the parallelization of electronic states is nearly trivial. You can do that easily. For the linear response, TD DFT with Casita formalism. You can very easily parallelize all the electron hole pairs. I think I have data production calculations done with 8,000, maybe 16,000 CPU cores. In practice, one could use 32, 40,000 CPU cores for these calculations, but for, for the queuing system and these kind of considerations, it's more expensive, so only, only 8,000. Also, if it's a better equation, you can parallelize all the electron hole pairs. If you have a GW, can parallelize over the image in function shape of it. Here you can see just uh, some sort of uh, uh, scalable curves and seeing that uh, both in cross state calculus and in TDDFT you can really scale to what can say to tens of thousands of CPU cores if you have that kind of curves available. Scalability as such, even though especially a lot of people more involved in the high performance computing than physics, they're very fond of this. I think it's actually quite stupid measures. I can make any code scale extremely well if I just make the computation poor enough. I mean it's if I make the computation inefficient enough, I can I can just get any scaling I want. So it's maybe not the uh, not the best measure of, of the movements of code. So, of course, it's probably interesting to know what's the most absolute performance. And uh, 
my experience with playing with the GPO and some other equivalent codes is that uh, generally you, you could say that uh, it has similar performance. Depending on which kind of system you are studying, which size of system you are studying, what property you are studying, sometimes GPO is faster, sometimes a little bit slower. But generally it's uh, more or less in the same form. And I would also say that it's uh, quite difficult to make really uh, fair comparison between different codes. But they will have uh, uh, sometimes different convergence parameters. So the sort of parameters you use in one code you have usually different in others. They are multiple different different approximations and so on. But what you can see here is one part of the case, uh, one quite popular plain day code versus cheap code in uh, System containing some uh, uh, magnesium dehydrate, quite large system, almost uh, uh, 1,300 atoms. And these are just some, some results from the very new trace of the computer at CSC in Finland. And in here, uh, x axis, the number of here is the number of nodes. Each node in this machine has 16 CPU cores, so at this point, we have something like 1,600 CPU cores. And to measure here in Y scale, that's now something like. Uh, so, what was done here was one total energy calculation, one full SCX cycle for this system. And to measure here is that how many of these kind of you can do in one hour. And in this particular case, you can see that the uh, CPO does a little, little bit better than this popular uh, code. If you could pick a different system and maybe some real physical quantity, the result might be a little bit different, but, but we, are, we are more or less in the, in the same ballpark here. Okay, so that was uh, pretty much everything I wanted to add about the, uh, giving you sort of some kind of big picture about cheap. So it's really nowadays very versatile problem. It has lots of different uh, features. I think the amount of users that to be quite large as the number of developers. Um, there are some, in my opinion, quite unique features in the code. So the ability to use different basic sets with otherwise same approximation, for example, just the same BAW approximation and different basic sets. I'm, I'm not sure if there are any other goals that I can actually do that. Not that it's very many around. Uh, it's, uh, uh, as we did here, you can study many, many different things with GPO, and it's very well suited for muscle parallel calculations if you want to calculate something big. If you want to calculate something small, the really small systems, they are maybe not the really strongest point of GPO, but on the other hand, you are maybe not spending that much time if you're studying bulk systems with uh, few atoms there, so 50% difference in performance is maybe not something that, that kills you if the code is otherwise easy to use and uh, has useful features. Uh, finally, I should of course acknowledge some uh, uh, funding agencies and especially all the people who have been developing GPOL and I hope we will get some update for this feature during this uh, three days and this was taken in the Psyche conference in 2010. Thank you for your attention and if you have now any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Lucy, from Oxford University. Um, are there any questions? Actually, I could start with one. You showed this, this plot of the performance of G4 versus Vast. Yeah. Was this, uh, how is the convergence in this case? Was that something you looked at? It was something that was not pre tested, so more or less uh, default uh, settings for Vast and more or less default settings for G4. So I think pre testing was probably 0.8 to launch first. Well, what about the convergence of the other uh, 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 self consistent? Self consistent, I think that was. More or less same. I don't remember now how many is in total energy, but okay. And it, it converges in similar number of. Ah, uh, yes. Now you are opening the binary box. I mean, I think T in these systems uses 
almost two times more aesthetic heuristics than most, but running heuristics is much cheaper. It also depends on the algorithm you use, so mm -hmm. sort of matrix vector, uh, eight times five iterations, uh, you're doing the plus for single iteration. That was that's why I'm cheap also. I mean, when you're really trying to compare the codes, uh, I'm sure one could tune some parameters of bus to get it faster. I'm sure one could spend more time tuning the mixing and uh, I guess all the parameters for cheap or get it a little bit faster, but it's the code using more or less the sort of default bus and not too much technical. So how many systems have you tried before you got this one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have uh, any, any data with me here now, but uh, as I said, I mean, I have done tests where the table is lower, and I have done tests where the table is faster. This is basically just that uh, Dirk Birkman at the uh, department, he had been doing some tests with us, and he was interested to see how the table performs with the same system. So I just took his short of ebook script and made it with the table. So I'm sure, I mean, I can promise you, I can, prom I can provide you kickers where Chico is much, much better than us. Mm. That's all about this. I can also promise kickers where it's much, much worse. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I'm not uh, never so easy. Uh, more questions? Yeah, it's a little bit along the same line to talk about the LibXC and the library. And then there's also a discussion on the mailing list that actually for some of the I mean, some of these exchange based functions are smaller than others, and you can see it in the is slow yeah. compared to if you just did sort of a real thing. Yeah. So, and it's pretty hidden, I have to say, if you're not coded at all. Which have been implemented sort of to be fast? Is this something you, you discuss if you should have, for instance, in the very uh, five ones that are actually used? I think that's a good question. I guess in most cases, the sort of uh, argument uh, not doing very much on this issue is that, uh, let's say, typical case, you spend very little time in the evaluating the XGS correlation, especially if you are doing nearly a or something like that. Something like that. Yes. But uh, of course, there are some systems and some sort of cases uh, where this starts to be more important. I don't, that's maybe something uh, for the developer discussion on the, on the first day that is there actually, because I mean we had the implementations, original implementations in GPO uh, for at least some LDAs and GGAs with SAR, I don't know, maybe factor two faster, and the same on the where the ones should use, but it's always how much code you want to make, <coughs> and I mean. I think as you said, this is exactly one of the things that we could discuss on the, on the third day or during the uh, lunch and coffee breaks but it's important of course that the users give the feedback to the developers and, and uh, so, so, so they can get some, some feedback about how G4 actually performs and what are the problems. Okay, if there are no other questions for you, I think we should thank them again.